This has 82 different functions. 83 if you wish to light a cigar. So, I saw The Joker recently. I don't enjoy many contemporary films, but I was willing to go into this with open eyes. What I'd seen in commercials looked compelling, and I've been hungry for a decent comic movie for a while now. I find Marvel's cinematic product mediocre at best, with most of DC's offerings trailing far behind that, so I felt there was a lot of opportunity here to do something fresh and new for the genre. So, does the Joker deliver? From the moment the opening text hit the screen, I knew I was in for one hell of a ride. Director Todd Phillips and his team create a dense and unrelenting atmosphere to set their story in. Under Phillips' lens, Gotham feels like a real city. Dirty. Crowded. And with precious little resources to go around. The wealth that is in the city is concentrated in the hands of those least concerned with Gotham's ills, those privileged few who have grown fat on its labors while keeping their own hands free of calluses. The sense of hopelessness and despair here is tangible. There are no foolish looking extras and neon makeup lingering in alleyways or magic rooftops to jump your tank over. Just the cold, unrelenting pavement and asphalt that makes Gotham less of a city and more of an open-air prison. It's here that we meet our unlikely title character. Much has been made of Joaquin Phoenix's performance, and I can only dazedly agree. As Arthur Fleck, Phoenix transcends his recent role as a public figure, his notable quirks and personality traits vanishing quicker than a New England clown down a sewer. As Fleck, Phoenix is mesmerizing, portraying a character you'd walk right past in the street but cannot take your eyes off of on the screen. The actor's physical transformation is remarkable. Instead of expensive CGI and makeup trickery, Phoenix goes full method, reducing his once healthy body into Fleck's agony-wracked frame through diet, exercise, and dance. As with a dancer, Phoenix's tool of expression is his body, with every gesture considered informed by both internal and external struggle. At turns serpentine and psychotic, his movements are half invocation and half exorcism, making the overly sexualized gyrations of Harley Quinn in the previous Suicide Squad film out for what they really are. Not bold statements of self-liberation and freedom, but lead-footed pandering by a studio mostly out of touch with the treasure trove of modern pop mythology they fell back asswards into. But don't let me get off topic here because there's a lot to unpack. It's not just the physical. Thanks to Phoenix's remarkable performance and level of commitment, one can almost hear the thoughts in Fleck's head. Noisy, boisterous things that howl, hoot, and gibber at the moon. Here, mental illness isn't portrayed as some easily understood and quantifiable condition. It is instead both morbidly mundane and horrifyingly random. Unlike Suicide Squad's crass commercial exploitation of mental illness, Joker explores the concept by daring to make it ugly, unglamorous, and entirely real. The idea that anyone would wish to emulate this character is a stretch. There is no larger-than-life hero to battle. There is no glorious final conflict that takes up the last 20 minutes of screen time. Instead, what we see is unpalatable and punishing, with the title character living in squalor, skating from one incident to the next without any pop culture endorsements from popular songs a la the Disney Marvel films. Yes, there is that one recognizable tune, but that exists in the context of the character's reality and not the audience's. That music isn't there to get you psyched, it exists to underscore the terror that's about to unfold. Phoenix is given a lot to work with here. The screenplay by director Phillips and Scott Silver is nuanced and well-developed, providing plenty of incentive for the actor to reach, both literally and metaphorically. The writers do a fine job establishing the character of Arthur Fleck from the moment he appears on the screen. 
He's given a depth and relatability, while at the same time showing signs of an erratic and unpredictable nature. Phoenix succeeds in making you want to like Fleck, in spite of the fact that you'd cross the street to avoid him. It's this commitment that sells what might otherwise be nasty medicine. Within ten minutes of watching this guy, I forgot there even was a Batman. That's quite the trick. But lest you think that I'm reviewing a one-man monologue, I'll speak for a moment about the rest of the cast. Francis Conway, as Penny Fleck, delivers a surprising and emotionally wrought performance. As the mother of the monster, one feels both pity and revulsion as we learn her story, with the weight of her actions almost physically bearing down on the actress at times. Brent Cullen, as Thomas Wayne, acquits himself admirably, playing a man above the problems of the city that he wishes to control. He's entirely convincing in his performance, not an easy thing to do when playing such a broadly unsympathetic character. Zazie Beetz plays Fleck's love interest, Sophie Dumond. There's not a lot I can say about this character without getting too into the story, but the actress does a fine job in the role. Robert De Niro, as late night TV host Murray Franklin, is just okay. I understand why he was a big get for this film, but De Niro is simply outperformed by Phoenix at every turn. In truth, De Niro is Joker's weakest point. His presence, essentially the light under the door crack, that reminds you that this is just a movie. If you go into this film expecting the typical comics romp, you will be sadly mistaken. Unlike some other directors who feel that the genre is below them, Phillips tackles the concept of a Joker film with style, grace, and an understanding of the character that goes beyond a mere grease-painted foil for roided-up establishment types and rubber muscle suits. The Joker doesn't need a dark knight to frame his story, because we discover his story's eternal. The outcast. The outsider forced to the edge of society by those too fearful and cowed to step out of the imagined safety of the herd. In a world where the powers that be would convince you that all is black and white, Joker is an unrepentant streak of violet and emerald, a smear of grease paint and a drop of blood on an otherwise impeccable suit. It defies convention without piercing the veil of belief, dancing like its title character on a line so impossibly fine that it vanishes before one's eyes. The word immersive is thrown around a lot, but no 3D glasses or digital trickery are needed for it here. Instead, the immersion is created by accessing and exploiting emotion, tapping into our pre-existing need to tell one another stories. It is through these stories that we come to understand the larger book that binds them, the mysterious and often contradictory tome of life itself. Joker is one of those stories. There are those who would condemn this film without even seeing it. It's dangerous, they'll tell you. It celebrates incel culture, or is a war cry for those deemed deplorable. What these folks seem to miss is the real message of this film that it's apathy that creates society's monsters. Closing doors in people's faces, shutting down public discourse, and demonizing those ideologically opposed to you doesn't prevent the culture you claim to despise. It merely feeds it, strengthening it into something more than its incohate parts. Of course, any film that might point this out is problematic. It doesn't fit the all-important narrative being pushed by an industry who has always put propaganda first. Truly the handful of worthwhile films that come out of this system are almost always created by the outliers, those that create in spite of the fact that the deck is eternally stacked against them. One might be compelled to call me on this point, but Mink, you're saying, Todd Phillips and Scott Silver are totally establishment filmmakers. Now the last thing I want to do is go to bat for the guys who made the Hangover movies and Friends. But folks change, and artists grow. Phillips and Scott seem to have worked themselves into a position where they can actually produce compelling, thought-provoking content, while at the same time making money for their parent company. How Warner Brothers will take this is anyone's guess. 
After years of unsuccessfully aping Disney Marvel, they finally have something of their own. Not some horseshit meta comedy about a wall breaking anti hero whose body count is exceeded only by his bad jokes, but instead a dense and potent look at the human condition. Reactions to the Joker have been mixed. Some slander or dismiss it, while others line up time and again to witness it, thrilled to have something, anything, other than the usual message-infused Hollywood tripe. Me? Once was enough. Of course it's rewatchable. The film's vision of a grimy 1970s era Gotham alone makes it worth that, but I feel that personally, I got what the filmmakers were trying to impart, at least to the extent that my wobbly 49-year-old brain can. Some films take the viewer outside of their comfort zone, presenting ideas and concepts unpalatable under other circumstances. But Joker is an entertainment with a capital E. That's just the makeup applied to cover the greater, far more frightening truth. Joker is, instead, a mirror, held up to a society that, for too long, has promoted moral elitism over individual freedom. That freedom is to simply be, whoever and whatever you are, accepted without fear of rejection, acknowledged without being dismissed. However you slice it, in the end, the joke's on us. For the old guys who like old comics network, I'm Jason Mink. Thanks for watching. So, I saw the Joker recently.